Apple's M1 chips seem super fast, but benchmarks can be misleading. So how fast is the M1 really? Our high performance core is the world's fastest CPU core. Like, it's super fast. Seriously, folks, this is a very impressive chip. But the question is, how did they make it so fast? Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show where we try to answer the question, but how did they make it so fast? By now, you probably already know that Apple is ditching Intel processors in its computers in favor of the M1. This is an SoC that Apple has designed in-house. Now, SoC means it's a system on a chip, which means it is all the different parts you need to make a computer, but on the same chip. It's also a RISC processor, which is a topic we've been discussing a lot recently, and that essentially means that these chips have more DNA in common with smartphones than they do with your typical desktop or laptop. In our last episode, we pitted the new M1-powered MacBook Pro against Microsoft's also RISC-based Surface Pro X and a 16-inch MacBook Pro with an Intel CPU. Now, in those tests, the M1 delivered some truly impressive results, especially when it comes to single-core performance. But like I said in that video, the benchmarks don't tell the whole story. See, when a benchmark says single-core, what it usually actually means is single thread. A thread is a sequence of instructions. These are the basic operations a processor can do, like add these values together, multiply these numbers, or load this bit from the memory, and it's issued by a program. The deal is most Intel or AMD CPUs are designed to try and process two threads at once, so-called multi-threading, whereas many RISC or ARM-based chips, like the M1, are instead optimized to process a single thread. It works like this. The instructions issued to a CPU may need to use different execution units within a CPU. These are the bits of the processor that handle math. There are execution units for addition and subtraction, and frequently other ones for multiplication or division. And these are further subdivided between units that handle integers, or whole numbers, and those that handle numbers with a decimal point. A CPU is fastest when every part of it is kept running all the time. Any idle execution units means wasted potential performance. Instructions are loaded into the CPU one at a time in a thread, and the CPU tries to dispatch them to the execution units in the most efficient way possible. Now, in an x86 chip, like one from Intel or AMD, different instructions can take different lengths of time to complete. Because of this, you can have parts of the chip sitting idle or you may have one instruction that is waiting on the result of another instruction's math to be able to start working. So what can you do with these times when parts of the chip are idle? Well, you can turn around and start processing data from another thread and keep all bits of the processor moving. By contrast, Apple's chip doesn't support multi-threading. Instead, it's optimized for one thread per core. The result of all this is that in a single core test like Geekbench, that is actually a single thread test, the M1 gets a huge advantage. Tests like this are essentially handicapping the Intel or AMD chips, and their performance in these tests doesn't really reflect how they might perform in the real world. In fact, when the folks at WCCF Tech and Extreme Tech managed to get Cinebench, a popular benchmarking tool, to run two threads through a single core, they found that the performance advantage of the M1 pretty much evaporated compared to other modern laptop chips. So, some benchmark programs like Geekbench and Cinebench show the M1 with a massive advantage over Intel and AMD chips, but that isn't necessarily reflective of how they'd perform in the real world. I saw a little bit of this in Cinebench myself, where the M1-based MacBook Pro scored massively high in single-core performance, but in a multi-core test, my Intel-based 16-inch MacBook Pro was actually faster. But here's the thing. While some of these scores may be inflated, it turns out the M1 is still really fast when processing real-world work. And it got me thinking. If the secret to the M1 speed is that it's so good at keeping all parts of the chip fed with data, well, how did they do that? And why can't Intel or AMD? Apple wasn't talking. They are pretty notorious for not disclosing any chip details. So instead, I called up the CTO of the RISC-V Foundation, Mark Himmelstein, who has written code for pretty much every major architecture of the last 30 years. Mark stressed that multi-threading isn't really a feature, it's kind of a band-aid. It's to make up for those times when parts of the chip are sitting idle. Mark actually said there are certain situations where you would probably turn off multi-threading, like in high-performance computing, where you've written custom code to run on a certain CPU configuration. If you know exactly what resources a CPU has to work with, it's easier to write code to take advantage of all of them. But modern operating systems, like Windows, have to be designed to run on a 
ton of different hardware configurations. So while they have to be flexible, they aren't as efficient, and multi-threading can help recover some of that lost performance. This may be part of the secret sauce. Apple built the M1, but they also wrote the version of Mac OS to run on it. And you can bet they designed the two in concert to be as efficient as possible. But aside from software, there are some unique features to the hardware here itself. And for more info on that, I called up Akash Jani, an analyst with the Lindley Group. Akash pointed out a few key features of the M1. For one, it is an exceptionally wide design. Now, this concept refers essentially to how many instructions the chip can process each cycle. And remember, a cycle is like the hertz in a three gigahertz chip. That is three billion cycles per second. The high performance Firestorm cores in the M1 have an eight wide decoder, which means they can issue eight instructions for processing every cycle. And this is huge. Most other modern chips have four or five instruction decoders, which means even though it runs at a slower clock speed, the M1 can issue twice as much work to be done every clock cycle. There are some big challenges with just adding more decoders to a chip. For one, it can add latency and it can also consume more power. And here being a RISC chip probably helps. RISC instructions are simple by their nature. They're usually designed to execute in one clock cycle and they're also all the same length, which means that a RISC instruction decoder tends to be much simpler and more efficient than one you would find in an x86 chip. This instruction decode stage feeds into a chip that has seven integer units, three floating point units, and three or four load store units, which handle actually writing the data. These execution units are the bits that actually do the math and run code. And again, this is a bunch of them. But Akash was pretty sure the real magic was actually elsewhere. Like all modern chips, the M1 shuffles instructions from programs around. See, if one instruction is taking a while, one way to boost throughput is to sort of flip ahead in the instruction thread and see if there are any other instructions you can get a head start on. All modern chips do this. It's called out of order execution. The chips try to run instructions in the most efficient order, but that's not necessarily the order the program submitted them in. For a basic example, imagine if a core in the M1 was issued 10 integer operations in a row, followed by 10 floating point instructions. If you ran them sequentially, you'd have half the chip sitting idle. But as long as the floating point math doesn't need the results of any of the integer operations to run, called a dependency, there's no reason you couldn't run them simultaneously. Or if you do have an instruction waiting for a result, or maybe for data to be fetched from the cache, the instructions in line behind it can jump the queue and get a head start. But if you think of instructions as a bunch of math problems, you can't send the answers back to the program in a jumble. You need to line them back up into program order. To do this, chips use a reorder buffer, which can hold the results of completed instructions while the chip keeps working. Once a batch of results are lined up sequentially, they are sent to the program, which never sees the shuffled order the instructions were actually done in. Most chips work like this, but the remarkable part is the size of the M1's buffer, on the order of 630 instructions, while many other chips are around 256. This may let the M1 keep working longer past a slow instruction that would make another chip stall. To keep those instructions flowing into the chip, it is fed by a comparatively large L1 data and instruction cache. Add in 12 megabytes of speedy L2 cache, and the M1 is designed top to bottom to keep those Firestorm cores fed with a lot of data. The thing is, with 15 or so execution units between math and load store, and an eight wide decoder submitting instructions, parts of the M1 probably are still sitting idle. The difference is that even with that, it is so ludicrously overbuilt compared to the competition that the M1 still manages to execute more instructions per cycle. This is another area where being a RISC chip may be an advantage. Compared to x86, where some instructions can take longer to complete than others, RISC instructions are intended to complete in a single cycle, which can make it much easier to keep a bunch of different parts of the chip moving in lockstep together. There are a few other advantages the M1 has as well. Apple has paired this chip with super speedy LPDDR4X 4266 memory, much quicker than a lot of competing laptops, and this memory is a shared pool between the CPU CPU and the GPU. This shared memory pool is relatively small, but the chips connected to it can access it at crazy high speeds, and Apple has paired the whole system with a storage drive that these chips can read or write to at nearly three gigabytes a second. The M1 is more than just a CPU as well. This SoC also includes a host of accelerators and coprocessors, like an image processor, matrix coprocessor, signal processor, neural engine, secure enclave, and others. These are likely boosting performance in some cases as well, though it's a little harder to isolate their effects. According to Anshel Saga, more insight and strategy, the real appeal to Apple
Apple of making their own chips might not be performance, but cost. Manufacturing all the different parts of a computer on one SOC can be cheaper than having to buy a bunch of different parts and assembling them into a laptop. Now that Apple has bought Intel's 5G modem business, Anshul seems pretty convinced that Apple's long-term plan is to build 5G connectivity into every one of their SOCs. One of the big goals for 5G is IoT, and it's pretty easy to imagine. Your phone, your watch, your laptop, your smart home, maybe even your car, all with 5G connectivity, all networked together, and probably all charging you a host of monthly subscription fees. I'm not sure that's the future I want, but for now, I'm still super impressed with the M1's performance. Aside from all the tests we ran, I even installed Divinity Original Sin 2 and have played that for a few hours on the M1 laptop. And it runs great. This GPU is definitely good enough for some light gaming. I tried to ask some folks about the GPU architecture, but Apple's graphics processors are even more of a black box than their CPUs, and all the experts just pretty much told me it seems super speedy, however they're doing it. The M1's GPU definitely did deliver some pretty solid gaming performance, all the more remarkable in a laptop that stays pretty cool under load and was so quiet I wasn't even sure it had a fan. And by contrast, my personal 16-inch MacBook Pro turns into a roaring furnace playing the same game. So what about the other chip makers? Will they ever catch up to Apple? Well, to be honest, they already are. While the SQ2 processor in that Surface Pro X delivered dismal results, it is based on Qualcomm's Cairo 495 core, which debuted all the way back in 2018. Qualcomm's new chips, based on ARM's Cortex-X1 cores, have the potential to be much faster, and they've adopted a lot of modern improvements. Among them, they're moving to an 8-wide instruction decoder, same as the M1. Intel's new Sunny Cove and Willow Cove architectures also introduce a lot of improvements, like a larger reorder buffer and more execution units that look a lot like the design decisions that Apple made with the M1. And if you do account for multi-threading, well, AMD's chips are still faster for the most part. But Apple's not gonna sit still either, and new, improved, and bigger versions of the M1 are expected soon. Hopefully, a topic I kind of harp on a lot, but we get a little more competition in this space, and chips get faster for everyone, or at least a bit cheaper. For me, well, my laptop is only a year old, but if Apple came out with an M1-powered version of the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and there is a rumored variant of the M1 with 12 cores that we're expecting to see any day now, I would seriously consider trading it and upgrading, especially if the new computer brought back the SD card slot. Mm -hmm. Please bring back the SD card. What about you folks? Have you gotten a chance to try out one of these new laptops yet? If so, let us know in the comments and let us know any other topics you'd like us to dig into. Stay tuned and we'll see you next time.